Today on Thurston County Connection, we're going to be visiting over at the Emergency Preparedness Center at Tilly Road to talk about uh, preparedness for disaster and such. And then we're going to be at the Lacey Fire Department on Fran Street in Lacey uh, talking about the Medic One system. Hi, Thurston County Commissioner Gary Edwards here, and we're in the Emergency Center down on Tilly Road. And September is Emergency Preparedness Month, so we want to make sure that everybody that's watching this program has somewhat of an idea of what Thurston County does in preparing for upcoming disasters that we hope never happen. And here with me is Kurt Harding, and he actually runs the show. So he's going to fill us in about how everything uh, fits on this process. Thank you. Welcome to the Emergency Coordination Center. Here at the Emergency Coordination Center, or as we call it the ECC, um, we turn around and we respond to disasters, but not only that, we prepare and we mitigate and we respond to um, all kinds of uh, emergencies that come up. And so we are constantly in a training, exercising, and preparedness cycle. Uh, here inside the ECC, one of the areas that I'd like to point out is we have a radio room over here that we can expand and bring in amateur radio emergency services uh, staff and their volunteers. And we have a lot of people who come into the ECC are volunteers to staff the radio room. They do emergency communications when uh, normal communication system and infrastructure is damaged or goes down. We also have volunteers that come in and staff our call center. And the call center volunteers essentially answer the phones and put out information to the public and put our information and our warning points out to the public so that they can uh, be prepared and understand what's going on with situational awareness. Here inside the ECC, we, as we respond to disasters and or emergencies, we have broken down into the operations section, the planning section. We also have our uh, uh, communication section, uh, public affairs and we also uh, do our logistics section here. So this is the nerve center for the county. What we do is we bring in the departments from across the county, uh, independently elected officials, um, to sit down and do the response to the disaster or the emergency. We have what we call a com comprehensive emergency management plan that takes all of our various functions and we put those into emergency support functions or, or what we call ESFs. And as an example, um, ESF-8, which is public health, we turn around and we do all the public health response and uh, uh, response and uh, recovery actions from there, but we bring in the appropriate stakeholders, such as the Department of Health, we bring in uh, resource stewardship, we bring in all the different agencies across the county and municipalities to help do an integrated response to whatever is taking place. As we walk through this, I also want to stress that um, when we go from response, and our response actions are to in help uh, preserve uh, lives, property, and the environment within the county. But as we transition from response to uh, recovery, then we start looking out and do uh, restoring the infrastructure, such as the roads, buildings, um, areas that we need to make sure are critical uh, infrastructure to ensure that the county and the citizens are supported. As we transition from recovery, we go into what we call mitigation. Mitigation is the area where we look at how can we eliminate or reduce the threat or the emergency that just happened. So we put in plans in place to look at reduction or elimination of the threat. But we also look at, as an example, if we have a flood, we look at how can we elevate structures out of the flood. We look for mitigation opportunities to, to go ahead and elevate buildings, elevate residences. So we look a lot at how we can uh, reduce or eliminate uh, future disasters. And then as we go into that, then we go into what we call planning. And the planning cycle is, Take a look at how we did in our last disaster, take a look at how we, future disasters and future threats, and then we put plans in place and update our plans so then we can exercise our plans to ensure that we have a cohesive team so that when the disaster does happen, our team falls in place and we can respond to the needs of the citizens out in the county. Kurt, uh, could you comment a little bit, because of one, of, one of our areas of concern are always the cost associated with the recovery process and how critical that is with uh, keeping proper records so we can get recovery costs if it's declared an emergency? 
Sure. Um, one of the areas that we look at when we look at recovery operations, uh, we look at the, if the federal government declares a major disaster area for Thurston County, we need to ensure that all the county uh, departments and all the cities, municipalities out there, all government agencies, obtain and, pre and prepare uh, records, ac adequate documentation, so that we do get the reimbursement from the federal government. Typically, if there's a federally declared disaster, the federal government will uh, bring in 75% of the cost to reimburse the county for repairing roads, repairing buildings, uh, replacement of vehicles or other uh, equipment that was damaged or destroyed during the disaster. Kurt, could you give us an idea of how the county stays prepared for any potential upcoming disaster? There's a number of areas the county uh, stays prepared. First, what they do is they put together a plan, and our plan we, we usually uh, look at is our comprehensive emergency management plan for the county, and we take that plan and we bring in all the stakeholders. We bring in other county departments, separate, separately elected offices, and we bring in municipalities, and we sit down and we pull together the plan on how to respond to a disaster. Once we get the plan in place, then we set up an exercise so we can test the plan, because one of the issues that we want to make sure is the plan is good, and so as we work through the exercising of the plan, and typically these uh, exercises are integrated not only at the local level, but also at the state level and sometimes at the national and international level. Then once we test the plan, we do an after action review so that we can then make comments on how well the plan worked and where the plan needed to be improved. Once we have the after action review completed, then we go in and we update the plan and then we go through the cycle all over again. And that's how we stay prepared for emergencies here in Thurston County. Okay, thanks. Kurt, could you give us a, uh, an example of the difference between a disaster and an emergency? The, the difference between a disaster and an emergency is, an emergency is when someone will call 911 and we dispatch resources, whether it's law enforcement or medical resources to help the individual or the family. For a disaster, what happens is an incident happens, such as I'm gonna use flooding as an example. It starts flooding, flood waters rise, we have to do evacuations, and so we start evacuating people out, and so we have to start prioritizing resources and helping people evacuate and shelter. So that's the difference between an emergency and a disaster. Thank you, Kurt, for taking time out of your busy schedule to explain to the folks exactly what entails emergency management and, and your role in that. Well, you're welcome, and thank you for visiting the ECC, and you're welcome anytime. Thanks. Here we are with Vivian Eason, and she's going to explain all of the emergency preparedness activities that could come in to saving your life. Thanks, Gary. So with the Emergency Coordination Center, um, the first point is that citizens be prepared to be on their own because that makes our job a lot easier. So what we do is we do a lot of um, disaster preparedness training for citizens. We are now switching after the Cascadia Rising exercise we have, that we did last June, we are looking at two weeks ready instead of the 72 hours. So that's a little more preparedness on the behalf of citizens. So we offer free training. We have map your neighborhood training. We have, um, we go out and do disaster preparedness training. We have safety fairs and we have our big expo on se September the 30th at Capitol Christian Center and that's open to the public and that is 10 to two. All the training that you put on throughout the county regardless of where it is, is generally open to the public though, isn't it? It's all open to the public okay. and it's free. Yeah. And so what we try to do is start out with people being prepared in their homes and having their family plans and then we move to the neighborhood and then we try to get people involved. So we have a volunteer group called our Disaster Assistance Response Team called DART. We have about 60 people on our, our role and they can help as much as they can, but we offer them training like community emergency response team training, which is a 20 hour training. They get sandbag training so they can go out and help citizens with sandbagging. They also are now doing um, some training on working in the ECC, but they're also out helping with community preparedness. So they fill in um, gaps that we can't, like if there's a safety fair and we can't go, for instance, one weekend we have two, and so the volunteers manage one of them and then uh, we'll send a team to both of those. But they're also going to be getting training on American Red Cross sheltering 
in October so that they can help staff up shelters if we're running short of American Red Cross volunteers. How would someone out there in the viewing audience, if they wanted to get involved and volunteer uh, with the organization here, how would they start that process? If they go to our website, so Thurston County Emergency Management's website, and they click on volunteer opportunities, they'll see a multitude of opportunities. They can be search and rescue, they can do our ham radio, they can also do the DART team, but there's, it depends on what their interest is, and we, we're, we welcome any of them, and so they can apply on, the forms are um, available, they can do an application. There is a background process which helps us because those people are going to be going out to help citizens and, and staff shelters possibly, and so we do need to have them backgrounded. I guess I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the volunteers that we have throughout county government that really add to the efficiencies and effectiveness of county government in total, uh, regardless of the activity that's taken place. And I'd, I'd certainly like to encourage any of you that would like to get involved in what we're talking about today, preparedness, to please uh, go to that website and check it out and see if you don't have some expertise that you could uh, help us with. So uh, thank you again to all the volunteers that do help. So one of the other um, things coming up for us is National Preparedness Month in September. So we'll be putting out, we do social media also, so we do Facebook, Twitter, we do Nextdoor. Nextdoor is a private neighborhood um, social media and we when we click and we do something on Facebook we're hitting like 22,000 people in Thurston County at the different neighborhoods so what we'll be doing is uh, messaging in September for National Preparedness Month and then October is the great shakeout so it's October 19th at 1019 we'll do the drop cover and hold drill and then also in October is our flood um, preparedness week and we'll be doing our um, calling out on our alert system. That's one thing I don't want to forget too is it's really important that you sign up for Thurston County's alert and notification system. And that is available on the front page of our website on Thurston County Emergency Management. That is how we communicate with the public to give them warnings and notices in disasters. And we'll be doing a test on that in October. So October is, is filled with a lot of information because that is Washington State Preparedness Month. So we've got like Moving into the winter, we're wanting people to get ready for our winter storms, which are most of our declared disasters are flooding and winter storms, power outages, getting people ready to be checking on their neighbors, ready to stay home if it's not safe to travel. You know, and as I always say, in your emergency kit, one of the things I've added is comfort food. Make sure you have, I see preparedness as being um, comfortable so if I'm going to have to stay home, which I can't because you guys you'll expect to be, me to be here, right? Be here working, but right? if I have to be home, then I want to have um, heat, water, food, be able to take care of my family, my children, my pets. So that's what we're looking at for community preparedness. Vivian, could you give us an idea of the individual preparedness and that process that you would recommend? So what I recommend is, of course, having supplies at home that we talked about. I also keep a 72-hour kit in my vehicle because if you're out on the road and you get stranded. But also for um, family planning, how are you going to communicate with your family in the time of disaster? So we, we have a, um, information on out-of-area contact because that's how you can communicate more readily in a disaster because the phone lines could be tied up. We don't know, in a, in a large scale disaster, we're not even sure cell, cell phones will be up and running. So having a um, continuity of operations, how are you going to communicate, what are your children's schools going to be doing, what's their plans? Each school is required to have an emergency plan, so what is that plan? Do they want you to pick up your kid or not? And then also, um, we have on our website, you'll find the 24 weeks to preparedness, and it's like a shopping list of how you can um, staff or stock your house and your supplies to get you prepared in a disaster. And just do a little bit at a time. A little bit to at a time up. on your budget yeah. because we know it can right. get kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. There's actually a list of things that you can do on a shoestring budget. So sure. peanut butter is a great preparedness food. But having food, having communications plan, who are you going to contact? Um, 
like for instance, my sister lives in California, so she would be the contact my family would call, and then we can let everybody know that we're okay. So that way, if it's hard to get out, you can text message sometimes because it's easier to get out on a text than it is a phone call. And at least once the systems are up and running, the text will go through. So there's just a different, a lot of information on our website. I really encourage you to go there. There's also ready.gov, that is the federal website. Washington State Emergency Management has a lot of information also. Again, all this information is free. Um, we do public education for free. And so we do training for the um, neighborhood preparedness. That is my favorite program, is the Map Your Neighborhood. You know, I guess I'd say that uh, having been here at the county for quite some period of time, and you tend to think, well, everything's going pretty smooth. But since I've been here, we've had a volcano situation that caused a lot of disruption. Uh, we've had major flooding, and we've had an earthquake. And all those came about fairly unexpectedly. So it's pretty important to make sure that you're prepared when the time comes, because we don't know what level of disaster we're going to be dealing with. And you can't always depend on the government to bail you out. You're, uh, you're kind of obligated to take care of yourself and your neighbors and, and friends that you can help, because that's when neighborhoods really pull together, is when we have uh, a situation like that develop. Yes, that's true, Gary. And also, um, when we give out warnings in advance, a lot of times we'll be giving out warnings and situations. And just being able to connect in, you know, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, you know, join some communication that you're getting information coming out. You know, we don't have, um, everything's on social media anymore, it seems like, but we try to hit traditional media. We have the, the films going on now on the TC media. We have different routes of information that we're putting out all the time. So um, just find what works for you. Have a trusted agency that you're following. Don't look at rumors. Make sure you're getting the information from a reliable source like Thurston County. Vivian, before we get done today, do you have anything else that you'd like to add to really bring this to a conclusion? Well, the big um, important decision right now is to sign up for our alert sense. And that is our Thurston County alert and warnings. And you can get that on our web page. Then also, um, the most important part of preparedness in your community is map your neighborhood. Map your neighborhood is a nine step process and six of those steps are done in your home. And then you go out into your community and you check on people that may have special needs. You know, maybe you have an elderly person that lives and they can't be out when it's snowing and, and zero degrees, you know, they need some heat. And so it may not be a huge um, federally declared disaster, but just some of our winter storms where people are without power for a week. Or it could be that when it's 100 degrees for several days and those people don't have air conditioning. But look at people that may have special needs and people that are more vulnerable and check on them and ensure that they're getting the help that they need. And if you, if you need to contact us, when we activate, or our phone number would be 360-867-2800, and that activates into our call center when we are activated, so we would be here. And we encourage you, we talked about the difference between an emergency and a disaster. In emergency, you call 911, but if it's just the power's out, or you felt the ground shaking, or something like that, that you don't need a 911 response, Please don't call 911 unless it is, a, it is an emergency, a life-saving emergency. They do have a non-emergency number, which is 360-704-2740. Or if it's something that is something that you need to talk to emergency management, again, our phone number is 360-867-2800. So we try to keep the emergency lines open for the emergency, life safety emergencies. And then the other part of our, um, department is Medic One, and Medic One deals with those emergencies when you're calling 911, so you'll learn more about that later. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vivian, for taking the time to spend a little time and, and uh, explain how very important it is that you be prepared for that un unexpected event, whatever it might be. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for being here.
And here we are with Kurt at the Lacey Fire Headquarters on Fran Street. And Kurt's going to fill us in a little bit about the Medic One process and how, how that fits in. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. Uh, Medic One is countywide. It's for all the citizens uh, within the county. And what it does is it provides emergency medical services, pre-hospital emergency medical services for anyone who has an emergency and dials 911. Um, what we have here is we have a foundation that starts with citizen awareness. We take citizens, we train them in CPR, train them to recognize situations where they need to call 911, and that starts the key part because for our cardiac arrest survival rate here in the county, we have one of the highest in the country. So what we start with is we found that if citizens uh, will start CPR on their own, that before help arrives from Medic One, we end up having a double uh, the survival rate for cardiac arrest than we would if there wasn't CPR administered before Medic One arrives. So then the second part of Medic One, the second tier is our emergency medical technicians or EMTs. That's part of our basic life support program. And we dispatch EMTs on every call, every medical call through 911. They're our first line of defense in the backbone of the system. What they do is they provide initial emergency medical care for the patient and, and then if necessary, we also dispatch paramedics, which is our third tier in our program. And the paramedics are part of our advanced life support program. And our paramedics come in and they prevent, uh, provide advanced life support care to the patient and triage in the field. And then if there's transport and there's a medical necessity, the paramedics will transport to the hospital. And that's uh, a basic life support and an advanced life support is what you're referring to? Correct. So the basic life supporters are emergency medical technicians, about 500 in the county, and they belong to the 13 different fire agencies around the county. And then the advanced life support is our paramedics, and there's about 60 paramedics, and they also are part of the three ALS, or advanced life support fire agencies here, Olympia, Tumwater, and then Lacey Fire District. What about the outlying areas? How are they covered? The outline areas are covered through the, our EMTs, and there's 10 outline fire agencies, and they're covered through emergency medical technicians. They're part of the program out there. And then the paramedics at the three different agencies have mutual aid agreements in place to dispatch out to those outlying areas. We found that it's a very cost-effective program. Also, it produces one of the highest cardiac survival rates in the nation, So, and that, all that uh, tied together makes a very effective system for the citizens of Thurston County. Well, it sounds like another good reason that uh, people ought to live here in Thurston County. It's a beautiful place to live, and we've got some services that are better than most. Absolutely. And then what I'd like to do now is also talk a little bit about our uh, training efforts at Medic One. We provide training, free training, uh, to the public. All they have to do is contact Medic One and we'll provide them CPR hands only training. CPR has changed a little bit over the years. It used to be people would be trained on compressions and then mouth breath, mouth to mouth resuscitation. It's changed now to only hands on CPR training for the public. The reason we've done that is, is we found that hands only CPR by the public is very effective for cardiac arrest. And that means compression? And compression only, correct. Compression only. Okay. So what we do is we'll provide that training. We have classes for the public, for anyone really who wants that. It's free of charge, and we train everybody out there who wants to be able to provide that compression only CPR. And how would uh, somebody from the viewing audience get in touch with your organization to get better trained personally themselves? All they have to do is contact us. Our telephone number is 360-704-2780, and we'll have someone that will answer and be able to give them, put them into a class. Super. Well, thank you very much, Kurt. Okay. And so what I'd like to do is now have uh, Lieutenant Don Bowman, who is a paramedic lieutenant, take you inside the uh, paramedic unit and show you a little bit more about the unit. Okay. Sounds good. Here we are at uh, Lacey Hit Fire Headquarters, and uh, we're still with the Medic One activity. And here uh, with me is Lieutenant Don Bowman, and Don's going to explain all the particulars that go into his job that has been going on now for well over 30 years. I can't. Yes. 39 years. That is an amazing service to the public that Don's been performing. And so there's no doubt about it. He's an expert. He's going to fill us in on what's happening. 
Well, thank you, Commissioner. What we have here is uh, this is an advanced, medic, advanced life support medic unit. Uh, we have about uh, seven of these around the county and uh, at various places. So that when you call 911, you don't necessarily get uh, the medics originally. A lot of times it goes out and the EMTs will upgrade us. If it's a cardiac arrest or something along that line, we'll be, get, we'll be sent initially. But we have uh, advanced life support. We carry medications to get the heart, heartbeat back. We can treat arrhythmias or problems with heart rates. We have um, uh, defibrillators that uh, a little bit different than what the EMTs are carrying. Ours also monitors heart rates and we can cardiovert patients, change their rhythm if we have to, if it's a life-threatening rhythm. We also carry advanced airway gear so that we can place a cuffed tube into the trachea to prevent vomitus and other foreign fluids from getting into the lungs. And we do that a lot on patients who are unresponsive or unconscious. So you see something like that all the time. And we do that in the field in your living room, out on the highway, inside of the roads. It, uh, it, it varies. Um, we also have a, uh, a ventilator now is our add-on. It's a brand new uh, item for us, and we've had it for a few years now. And what it basically does is we can set that up and pretty much take over the breathing. The machine will take over the breathing for, for that patient. Um, during the transport to the hospital. And it's basically, it's uh, portable. We can take it into the house. We can take it, we take it off the wall. We use it on the cot and we take it into the hospital when we have it hooked to a patient. Uh, used for a lot of different uh, breathing problems and uh, it works out just, just great. Um, so you may see, uh, you may see us start IVs. We start IVs on our patients. We give them medications to uh, alleviate the apprehension that they, some of them may have with some of the problems. Uh, you'll see us definitely doing uh, things along that nature in a cardiac arrest, whether you're in a supermarket or in the bank, it doesn't matter. Um, we need to have IVs established in order to give the medications that we use. Don, it sounds like this is pretty complicated stuff that you do on a daily basis. There must be some real extensive training that goes into this. Could you give us just a little highlight, if you would? Yeah, um, it's changed. It's changed drastically since I went to school. But uh, now we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of thousand hours for a paramedic during the during the training process, where they have to uh, either go through a clinical uh, stage where they're in a hospital setting, emergency room, ICU unit, and uh, uh, they they get to see a lot of hand and do a lot of hands on. In, in, in those uh, facilities. Um, then they come and they do a ride time with medics in the field when they're a student. And uh, there they get the introduction to the ALS side of things. Uh, a lot of our EMTs that become medics have a lot of that already in their background. So they understand what, what uh, is entailed. Um, we have to have uh, 50 hours of continuing medical education every year and we need at least 150 to recertify every three years. And uh, that entails a written exam. And uh, it's, uh, it keeps a lot of the medics on their toes. They, uh, it's like any exam. You really, you really look forward to taking the exam. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, outside of that, uh, uh, when I first started, we used to go and rotate through the hospital at St. Peter's in the, down into the OR because at the time we didn't get enough intubations in the field to keep up our, keep up our skills because the call volume was low. But now with our call volume being as high as it is, uh, we are no longer needed to go down into the surgery. But all of our new medics who come into the system go through a program where they are introduced to an anesthesiologist in the, in the operating room and stays, stays with that anesthesiologist throughout the day. And uh, that's where their skills are refined for intubating patients, placing those airways, which are very, very important to sustain life in the field. Well, again, thank you very much for your commitment over the well, last 39 it, it's years. It's been a pleasure. I have really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm looking for, uh, retirement next June. It'll be 40 years. Well, don't get in a hurry. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I really love the job. I'd hate, I'd hate to leave the job, but um, I'm 60, I'll be 68 next year, and uh, it's getting a little bit tougher to climb those ladders and hump that hose up the oh, ladders be because good. we also are firefighters and we play an important role in the fire department as firefighters so there's a big physical demand upon the medics sure. too and that's like it's like that with all the paramedics in thurston county they're all firefighters and uh they're like, they have they have both jobs that they have to uh, maintain skills in don maybe you could just give us an idea of how do you get into this line of work well it's it's not that difficult it depends on the individual you first of all you have to find an individual that will fit into this type of job atmosphere um, but i could tell people the easiest way to do something like this today would be to become a volunteer firefighter uh, stay with that department have them train you as an emt do a few years as an emt maybe uh, even some people work for pri private ambulance companies to get the get the volume the skills that background that you need because you do need to have a few years of experience as an EMT before you become a medic student. And that in itself again is another um, whole program where you're interviewed and uh, your, your uh, backgrounds checks are done and all that and your skills and your involvement as an EMT with, a, with either a fire department or an ambulance company. And if you can make a, a the the uh, the program's about a year long. It's very 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 uh, in intensive. You uh, basically uh, eat, sleep, and go to school. That's all you do. That's all you have time to do. And um, it's a uh, it's a uh, and you'll get as much out of it as you put into it. And it'll all reflect back on you when you take your exam at the end of the course to become a nationally registered EMT or a paramedic. And um, uh, it'll, take, it'll take that. We have two people now that are scheduled to start uh, in, in Tacoma on, on September of this year. And they will be running their course through the uh, diactic and clinical phases um, before they're turned to, to us to ride with us in the, in the field where we will monitor their um, involvement and how they do with patient care. They'll actually have hands-on as uh, students. I guess, what, I guess what I'd like to say is uh, it's pretty obvious that here in Thurston County, we have some first-rate firefighters, and uh, it all starts with somebody like, like Don 39 years ago taking that step to get involved with your local fire department and working your way up. It was really interesting. When I first started in 1978, uh, myself and uh, my partner, Jerry Warnock, he and I were the first two medics that came from the outside. The original medics with this Thurston County Medic One system were all trained at Harborview in Seattle, the University of Washington. Program very, very intense. One of the best programs in the nation. I wish all of us could go there. but. Um, Jerry and I had a lot to live up to to meet their standards when we first started. And um, believe you me, there was a lot of nights we didn't get much sleep because of things we were worried about in order to continue our job. Um, but you know, it's, it's worked really well over the years. We've had, uh, we've had some, we got some great medics in the system. Uh, we've had great medics that have retired already and they all wonder when I'm gonna retire, but um, I'm right behind them, I'm coming. <laughs> soon enough but um, yeah it, it's an intense program and but the trainings the trainings adequate it's awesome it's great training well again Don thank you very yeah, much you're for your service you're thank welcome you. thanks for joining us on Thurston County Connection and I hope you learned quite a bit about the medic one process and emergency preparedness and we visited both of the locations for emergency preparedness earlier and now we're here at Medic One, and I want to thank the Lacey Fire Department for taking the time to explain their whole process and letting people know here in Thurston County how fortunate they are to be served by the Medic One people.
Earthquakes, floods, lightning strikes, snowstorms, and wildfires are not uncommon in Thurston County. As parents, we always want to keep our families safe. Now with AlertSense, we can. All I had to do was sign up for the free AlertSense system. Now I get text notifications when there are weather hazards or other local emergencies. It was easy to sign up, and I was even able to customize it to get the alerts that I want to receive. Our AlertSense system is a new tool to notify citizens of emergency situations that may occur in their area. Citizens can also opt in to receive non-emergency notifications, such as flood or storm watches. Wireless emergency alerts are delivered automatically to your mobile device based on your current geographic area, not your home address. These types of alert include extreme weather warnings, such as flash flooding or other local emergencies requiring immediate action. Emergency telephone alerts use E911 data to send out emergency notifications via landlines to geographic areas, such as flood warning notifications for residents along area rivers. AlertSense also has the capability to activate the Emergency Alert System, a national public warning system which delivers important information over TV and radio broadcasts. To receive your up-to-date AlertSense notifications, register at www.co.thurston.wa.us slash em slash AlertSense. The AlertSense app is also available through Apple Store and Google Play.